ladies and gentlemen thank you for tuning in to another episode of bloom the podcast thank you all so much for tuning back in for another fun episode and we have a fun one today and i'm super excited about it and i hope you guys are as well um if you guys are new to the show we are glad to have you i'm so glad that you're here and i hope you are ready for a turbulent roller coaster we're going to be up and down all over the place today if you're new like i said my name is donovan i am your host today and we have like i said before a wild ride we're going to be going on if you guys are returning back in as regular uh consumers of bloom the podcast regular bloomers if you will you already know what we're doing today If you've watched the last two episodes, I was doing a two-part reaction um, video to uh, questions that girls were quote-unquote too afraid to ask guys, Um, all in the relationship um, realm, and I was reacting to this Christian couple who was doing a reaction video about various topics that girls had questions for about guys in relationships that they either felt like people weren't talking about it or they wanted a real answer from a guy's perspective, things of that nature. And I kind of broke that video down and highlighted some of the important aspects of that video and things to keep in mind, especially if it's women asking serious questions about relationships from a guy's perspective. I think there's a lot of misinformation there that that uh, gets moved around and given out to the popular uh, you know, masses. Um, so I definitely wanted to shine a light in on that and try and give a little bit more nuance and a little bit more um, truth there. Again, no shade on that couple. I had a great time reacting to their video. It was really fun. So if you missed those two, Go back and watch those before you watch this one because a lot of what we're going to be talking about today stems from those videos. Um, Because what we're doing today, in the last episode, I had put out um, the idea of for the final part of Spicy Questions with the Boys, we do reactions to your guys' questions and you guys can submit questions about things and I kind of opened it up it's not just girls asking questions from a guy's perspective it's kind of just anyone if anyone has a question go ahead and ask it and I'll talk about it if it's in the realm of stuff that we were talking about prior Um, and that's what we've got on tap for today Um, you guys submitted some spicy questions I've got spicy lemonade courtesy of the wife brought me for this episode and I'm ready to go And I just want to say I appreciate everyone who submitted a question. There's a lot of good questions, some vulnerable questions. And I'm kind of going to go through these questions on a tier basis. So it's going to get progressively spicier as we go. And um, by the end of it, I hope we've covered a lot of ground for you and hopefully helped you or encouraged you um, in some way. Um, So, yeah, again, thank you so much for tuning in and for submitting questions. Before we answer the questions, I'm not going to go through all my bullet points again on the last two, but there are those things, and shout out to the class if you remember what those things are when it comes to answering these types of questions. We've got how feminism has impacted relationships. We've got moral opinions on realities that just are. We've got differences between men and women. We've got... You know, a plethora of things that I've mentioned in previous episodes about these kinds of questions. So hopefully we're keeping all those things in mind as we answer these questions. Because, again, we have to talk about what is first before we make moral statements or moral opinions or, you know, anything in that realm (laughs) before we do that. So. I'm going to jump straight into it so that way we can uh, get to your guys' questions. And uh, again, thank you all for submitting your questions. This has been going to be super fun. Question one. We have, what do you do if you go to a small church with no prospects? Ah, man. Yeah, that's this is a popular question because there's a lot of small churches if you don't go to like grace church or like a mega church or something it it's very possible that you will 
fit into this demographic of feeling like you attend a small church. There's not a lot of people your age, maybe, or maybe the people your age are not people that you're really interested in. So I've definitely heard this question quite a bit, and I have felt like I have been in this question before. So I definitely relate. But I think this is a fairly easy question to answer. And the answer would just be go to more places. Up your proactivity level. Um, I think it's very easy to get stuck in a small church and just kind of wait and be like, well, one day some new person's going to come and then I'm going to be the first to jump on them and then that's going to be it. That's going to be, it's going to be, you know, checkmate. And that might happen for you. I mean, that's not exactly how it happened for me, but it kind of similarly, it was a new person in a congregation that I had mutual connection to and relationship started that way and it was great. But also proactiveness is a, a very important key when it comes to being at a small church and maybe not having a ton of connections in that church and not having a ton of prospects in that church. You want to increase your visibility, if you will, your radius of reach. And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You can go to, you can visit other churches with friends. You can go to other Bible studies from other churches, different college groups, different career groups. You can go to different um, events and things that churches put on where you have a higher chance of meeting someone that is of Christian faith and give yourself more prospects to choose between. Um, and that's one way of doing it. And there's a lot of things you can do. There's a lot of options for that. So I think that's a pretty easy one. I think if you're a girl, I think online dating is extremely effective. <laughs> For guys, not so much, but I think that's also an option. If you're a guy and you want to do it, knock yourself out. I think a lot of people have weird uh, stigma around online dating, and it's not, in my opinion, the most effective thing in the world. But again, it's increasing your radius of options, giving yourself opportunities to not only see people, but to be seen by people. Um so, yeah, that, I think I think that's a good place to start. And then I think even from just the introspective um, side of things, how much is a relationship a priority to you? If it's something that you actually want and that you're praying for and that you're looking forward to, go out and look for it. I think pride is one of the things that gets in the way most when it comes to questions like this because you have a lot of stigma from churches and people that are too prideful to say, hey, I want to be in a relationship and I'm actively seeking out how I can do that. A lot of people like to take the Jesus take the wheel, I'm going to sit on my hands approach to these kinds of situations and just say, well, when it's the Lord's timing, he's going to, you know, bring Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect into my life. And then I'll know that they're the one. And it's like only in relationships do people take this t type of approach. If you want to get a job, you have to submit applications. You have to go out and interview. You have to look for opportunities to to get a job. If you want to go to a college, you have to submit applications to your college. You have to submit loan applications. You have to do steps. You have to do things to get to where you want to be. But then when it comes to relationships, everyone's like, oh, you know, it happens. It's, it's just going to happen. God's timing. God, God's timing. And I don't want to minimize God's timing in any regard because God's timing is perfect and nothing will happen outside of the Lord ordaining it to be so. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility to act and to move and to pursue things that you want to pursue. Those two things go hand in hand. And I think it'll be a lot easier for you to see in the Lord's timing who the person is for you if you are actively pursuing a relationship and either disqualifying candidates or changing your standards or being in the mix of relationships and seeing what it is that's important to you, what it is that you know, you can work on to be better for a relationship. Like all those things happen in the midst of pursuit of a relationship. So I would definitely say don't let pride be a hindrance to pursuing other avenues. If you do go to a small church and there are indeed actually no prospects there, don't let the stereotypical, I don't want to look desperate or, you know, you shouldn't want a relationship that bad. Don't let any of those 
commonly said phrases get in the way of you doing what you need to do, especially as a man. Obviously, for girls, it's a little bit different. Yes, you want to you want to put yourself in scenarios where you're surrounded by people that you want to potentially, you know, qualify and see if they're a prospect for you. But you don't want to just be asking people out left and right. But you do want to be in an area where you can be seen by those people and they can pursue you. And for guys, you have to be pursuing. If you're not pursuing, you're not going to get into a relationship. It's just that simple. You have the super far off exception where you have a girl that kind of initiates and gets the ball rolling for you. But if in general terms, it, as a man, if you're not out there pursuing and being proactive, you're going to have a real hard time. Even if there are prospects in your church, you're going to have a real hard time landing one of them if you aren't acting. And remember, no action is still action. If you don't do anything, that's still something. And people are looking at that, observing that, and that is going to affect the way that people perceive you in, in a relationship status. So just remember that. I, I think a lot of people think if I don't do anything, then nothing will happen. Like, you know, they w won't have to risk anything or nothing bad will happen. And I couldn't disagree more. The less you do, you know, the more you're just going to stay stagnant and regress, honestly. Um, so I think that's a big thing as well. And I think the last thing I'll say on this one is what are your standards looking like? Are there actually no prospects at your church? Like zero. There are zero young people. There are zero people that you find attractive. There are zero people that are godly. Are there really zero people in that demographic for you? Or are your standards a little weird or potentially too high? Are you potentially looking for something that you don't really need to be looking for? I think that's a question you need to ask yourself as well. Because I've seen that quite a bit as well. You go to a small church. There are people in your demographic. There may be three people in that demographic, but they're all, you know, godly individuals and you're more or less attracted to them. And, you know, there's there's people there with potential, but you just don't see them that way. I think that's a very real possibility. So I think reevaluating your standards is a good place to also start when it comes to even making the question of there's no prospects of my church. What do I do? So I hope that's helpful. I think there's obviously more that could be said on that, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Just get out there, go to other, seek out, seek out other opportunities, be proactive, don't let pride get in the way, and make sure your standards are reasonable and biblical. I think that's important. Reasonable and biblical. All right, let's go to the next question. Okay. Um, let's see. The next question is, should you expect your boyfriend or girlfriend to respect your modesty convictions? And that's kind of all the question says. There isn't necessarily a defining of what respecting modesty convictions means. In my mind, what I read that to mean is, does this person more or less conform to what makes you comfortable with your conviction. Um, so I'm going to try and take the question more or less from that angle because I think that's an important angle to discuss it from. Because I think obviously you could be in a relationship with someone where you guys know that you disagree about modesty standards, but you quote unquote respect that person's conviction. You don't see it as wrong or you don't judge them for it. You know, you kind of just coexist in that space while respecting each other's modesty convictions. But I think that's honestly less important because I think that doesn't really do anybody much good. If you guys are both kind of like, yeah, we'll just compromise on this. It's not that important because I think this is an important issue. Um, I think a good place to start is how important is this person's opinion of you and how important do you view their conviction from a biblical perspective is what they're talking about biblically informed is what they're talking about making sense logically and also where does the conviction come from i think 
it can be easy to make modesty a super just gray subject where no one really talks about it and everyone just says oh i've always done it this way or this is it it doesn't mean anything or i dress for myself or we have all these things that we tell ourselves when it comes to modesty that makes it kind of hard to pin down and actually hard to talk about because if you have a conviction on something that means that you've taken a stance hopefully you know where that stance comes from and you don't really want to waffle on it um so i think it's important to talk about i think broadening it out to other avenues is kind of where i would start is what things do you expect your girlfriend or boyfriend to respect conviction wise uh, in general are there things that you expect of them to do and if they don't do it it's a deal breaker what are those things for you i know modesty and like the way people dress is a very personal thing so it does sometimes land in a different category of things but i honestly think if you're in a relationship with someone that is ideally headed towards marriage you think that this person has godly characteristics whether it's male or female you're looking at this person and saying i think this person could be the person i marry my question would be why wouldn't you go more more or less towards their modesty conviction especially if it's like a reasonable modesty conviction and i think most of the time this conversation is aimed at guys having a conviction for their girlfriend or wife which is usually the stance i often preach that girls can equally have those convictions towards guys i think there's less avenues for that obviously because modesty tends to lean more in the female direction but why wouldn't you if if the if the conviction is not like you have to wear a burqa and you have to wear you know a potato sack because if you wear anything other than that it's too revealing and everyone's going to be staring at you blah 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 i think obviously there's some maturing that person needs to do and there's some evaluating of that conviction that you can hopefully discuss and hopefully move the needle around to find something that fits more of a reasonable um you know landing point but if someone comes out and says hey you know i think when you wear that low cut shirt that makes me uncomfortable i would prefer if you wore a shirt that looks a little bit differently first of all i think acknowledging if there's truth in that sentiment if you're wearing a low cut shirt and you can see straight down your shirt is it is it not then reasonable for that person to ask you to change that i think that makes sense I think that makes sense. Also, again, why wouldn't you? What about that do you have the attachment to that would make you not want to go that route? And again, I understand it's a personal thing when it comes to the way that people dress. So I understand that there could be some hurt there. If you've dressed a certain way for a really long time and someone says, hey, I think that the way that you're dressing is not appropriate or is sinful in some regard or is, you know, not modest that can be hurtful but again i think there needs to be an inward reflection of what am i wearing how am i presenting myself and if i'm in a relationship what am i showing out to the public is everyone seeing what should be for you know my boyfriend or girlfriend's eyes only is everyone seeing that and obviously if you're still dating and you're not married that person shouldn't even be seeing it either so there should just be a sense of wanting to keep your body for the person that you're with. Is, is outside attention still something that you're looking for? Are you still marketing yourself as someone who's looking, looking for outside attention with the way that you dress? There's a lot of questions there that affect the way that this question would be answered. But I think more or less my my thing would be why wouldn't you if my girlfriend if i'm dating someone like if sarah came to me while we were dating and said hey i think it, i mean i already have this conviction but <laughs> if she was to say hey when you are shirtless at the beach that makes me uncomfortable if that makes her uncomfortable that is important to me and i want to make sure that she knows that i'm looking to her opinion first before the outside or before what makes me happy 
we're supposed to be dying to ourselves for our significant other, for our spouse. And I think that starts a lot earlier than people think. I often hear like, oh, you don't need to lead in a relationship when you're dating because you don't have any authority over this person or the, the girl doesn't need to submit to this person in any regard because it's not her dad and they're not married. And I understand where they're coming from. There's validity to that. Obviously, you're not married and you don't have any quote unquote authority over this person's life. But why aren't we encouraging people to start falling into those roles with the people that they're dating especially if they're dating for marriage. Why as a man would I not start leading the person that I'm dating sooner rather than later? As Is it whenever the ring gets put on my finger, now all of a sudden I'm supposed to lead? No, you lead all the time. You lead through example, you lead through your testimony, you lead through your actions. And I think as the guy, you should be guiding the relationship as it goes and as it heads towards marriage. And I think in the same way, while you don't have authority over that woman until she you know, is married to you, there should be a sense of this girl looking to you as a leader and wanting to follow you as you guys move towards marriage. So that way it's not you know, bumping heads at everything because, oh, well, you're not the boss of me. You don't have authority over me, blah, blah, blah. And I see that constantly of people feeling that way of like living totally separate lives and not trying to get closer and closer until you are one and i think we should be pushing people to be thinking about how they would interact with this person as they would their spouse from an earlier point rather than viewing it from i'm totally autonomous until i'm married because that's a way harder transition to make of I do whatever I want until I'm forced to do otherwise versus looking to this person as someone that you want to change for, someone that you want to follow and someone that you want to make happy, someone that you want to respect. So when it comes to this question of do you respect your girlfriend or boyfriend's standards about modesty, I would say yes in 9 out of 10 cases. I think – Maybe 9 out of 10 is maybe a bit high, maybe 7 out of 10. I don't know. I think more often than not, though, there should be a understanding of this is important to this person. Either we talk it out and find a compromise that fits more to a biblical lens. Or if it's something super easy that I can do as far as changing my shirt or wearing a shirt to the beach or, you know, whatever the heck the, the thing is that makes that person uncomfortable. Again, why wouldn't you? And I think we should keep it there. Why wouldn't you ask yourself that question? What is stopping you from making that change? And I think a lot about your heart will be seen in that as you ask yourself and are hopefully honest with yourself in answering that question. Because most of the time when someone asks me to change something that I view as a spiritual freedom or as something that's personal to me, a lot of times it has more to do with my pride and my heart not wanting to serve others than it does the actual action itself of changing whatever the small thing is so definitely somewhat complex of a question depending on what the conviction is but i think again speaking in general terms why wouldn't you how much do you respect this person how much do you respect their convictions and their authority and their you know in their position in respect to yourself uh, i think is a good place to start okay moving on we've got Another spicy one. Again, we're getting spicier and spicier as we go. So we're almost hitting peak spice here. Is talking about previous sexual history mandatory and or wise? Why is it or why isn't it is the question. I think starting from as bare bones as possible, is it mandatory? No. Is it wise? I think so. I think it can be wise to talk about those things. I think it's a very challenging thing for people to bring up. It's not easy in any regard. But those are usually the things that are more important. The harder it is to talk about, typically, the more impact it has. And I think this is one of those things that can have a large impact, especially depending on what the context is. And I think that would be my next thing is context goes a long way. If you're talking about sexual history from someone who's like lived a pagan life for you know they're in their mid 20s or 30s or whatever and they've lived throughout their life as a non-believer i think it would be fairly reasonable to expect that they have 
some kind of past there and going into all the granular details about that may not be necessary but i think having just a basic logical common sense understanding that this person has probably engaged in that activity before marriage is a reasonable thing to assume how much impact does that have i mean i think it depends on the experience of that individual and i think it depends on how that person has recovered and repented of those things um obviously if they're a believer now that i would hope the assumption would be that they have ceased that activity until they have been married and that would be my assumption but again i think just talking about it context because the other context would be if it's a christian relation or a christian person who's just fallen into sin i think that happens a lot more often than people would like to talk about but that doesn't mean that there isn't grace or forgiveness there but that context is much different if it's something that that person has fallen into repeatedly and has asked for, you know, forgiveness and has fallen into it again and again, I think that could be something to talk about. And depending on what that person's life looks like, maybe a red flag for you, depending on how you see that individual. Again, I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to this question, but I think just the general principle would be what is the context of that person's background and are there things that are potentially going to affect you moving forward i think one of the interesting things is the sexual aspect of people's relationships is one of the biggest causes in divorce in the world and in christian circles as well it's a big issue for a lot of people so i think if you don't at least talk about it to some degree and get a, an understanding of what this person's thought is about that issue and if there are, there are experiences in the past that will negatively affect you moving forward i mean there's so many that are not just like having premarital sex like what if this person is a victim of some kind of sexual abuse or what if this per like there's situations like that where it's not necessarily willingful but it does impact the way that they view sex and the way that it'll impact your relationship as a whole um so I think just talking about it, I think also having an understanding that their forgiveness doesn't necessarily always mean that there aren't ramifications for the actions that people chose. And I think that's a big thing more in the Christian community than it is anywhere else because we view it more through the lens of Christ's forgiveness towards us. And yes, he washes all of our sins. We don't have to worry about it. But that doesn't mean that choices that we make in this life don't have after effects as we live on so while there's no real reason to harp on those issues in your relationship it really does no benefit for either person to talk about that continually or to have that in the back of your mind constantly i think before you get married there should be at least some conversation of what those things are that may impact the sexual aspect of your relationship in a negative way um and I think, again, it'll be hard to bring those things up, but that doesn't mean that because it's difficult, we shouldn't talk about it or that we shouldn't, you know, discuss it. Um, so, yeah, I think those are kind of my thoughts on that. I think it's going to be different for every person because each person's experience with this issue is different. But again, talk talk about the context, talk about grace, talk about forgiveness, talk about all those things that are super important to the subject. And then I think you'll find a lot less stress and a lot less uh, worry about it. Because I know it can be something that people really worry about. In Christian circles, if you've had sex before marriage, you're instantly viewed as, you know, either not as holy or not as you know spiritual not as christ-like all these things and we treat it as like a higher tier sin than we would anything else it's kind of one of those like dirty issues and while i'm not saying it's not a, a sin it's not something that should be talked about i don't think there is a need to make people feel guilty over sin that's already forgiven so i mean yeah I think I think that's kind of where I land on that issue. Um, there's definitely a lot more that could be said about it, but I think as basic as we can go in general terms without more context of a situation, I think that's kind of where I'd land uh, on that issue. Okay, 
going to this last one. This is the only one that actually uh, gave a little bit more context. And I appreciate this person for opening up and being vulnerable and submitting this question. Um, I hope to be able to encourage you and help you in any way. Appreciate you for asking the question. So I'm going to read off what this person sent in and then we'll go from there. So bear with me. The question is, I got divorced recently and fear that dating will be harder because of it. My ex-husband was emotionally abusive, manipulative, and had narcissistic behavior. He was previously a believer, and then in parentheses says maybe not truly, and became an unbeliever. I did everything I could trying to save the marriage anyway, but he didn't want to. So of course my question is, are guys okay with dating a girl that was divorced for those reasons? Oh man, yeah, there's a lot there. And there is a lot of information that I still don't have that would that could lead to a, some misinformation of my answer, but I will do the best that I can with what I've been given. <laughs> um, excuse me. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll start with the information that I don't have that could impact this and this person can kind of decipher out where they potentially are in some of these. Um, one of the things that I thought about was the church's involvement in your life in the divorce. Was this something that happened inside of a church that was, you know, you were supported by your elders and everything, you know, was handled properly and you have people in your support system that are on your side trying to help you get through this really tough time? I think that's a big question. I think obviously the question could also be asked, are there kids involved? You know, is this marriage something that lasted a long time and kind of spiraled out? Or is this something where it only lasted a few years? I think that's a, a question that could impact how this answer goes. Um, the age of the individual, is this a divorce that happened later in life or earlier in life? Obviously, that's a question. Um, so I think factoring in some of those things will be helpful for you to decide, you know, where where you land in some of this. Um yeah, I think I definitely don't want to give a false assurance of like, no one will care about it because that's not true. There's going to be guys that care about it and may reject you for it and may disqualify you as a prospect for it. I think that's something that you need to understand. I think that's not necessarily great that that is a reality, but that is a reality that's present with us there's going to be plenty of people that will be okay with it what that demographic will look like will be different in, in my opinion i think that would be different i think there will be people that will come along that will be more understanding that will be more experientially close to that that may have you know experience something similar there may be people that just understand your situation that grew up and have different experiences that lend them to being more empathetic to where you are currently i think that's an, an important thing to note but yeah i think there will be people that will disqualify you for it and i think there will be people that will overlook that um i think it's important for you to to really assess where you are in the healing portion spiritually emotionally physically from this event because i think there's a lot of times where we want to get into a relationship and we want to do things but we're potentially not ready for it yet and we don't want to bleed on people that didn't cut us and i think that's a potential with a situation that's super heavy like this and again, I'm not sure where you are personally in that recovery journey, but that is something to keep in mind because it could potentially push people away if you are bringing forth a lot of this into a new relationship where this person didn't have any wrongdoing against you, but is still receiving some of that treatment that may be residual or left over from a previous scenario. So that's something to keep in mind. I think transparency is also going to be a big thing for you. You want to be open and upfront with it would be my advice about it. 
because if it comes later on and it kind of blindsides an individual, it's going to feel a lot heavier and it's going to feel a lot worse for that guy looking at you as a potential person to marry if it's not something that he knows about and can willingly invest himself into from the gate. Now, I don't think it's something you need to throw around, you know, willy nilly and it's just some light thing you're just talking about, like, oh, yeah, I was divorced, blah, 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 like, and not talking about it with the weight that it has. But I definitely think getting it out there sooner rather than later is going to be important for you. So that way that person can make an informed decision on being involved with you in that way. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and I also think it's important to note that you don't want to look for this person to heal. <laughs> the people are not put in, they're not qualified to do that. Only Christ can do that kind of work in a person's life to really bring that kind of healing. He puts people in our lives that help us and that guide us, but there won't be any individual that will heal you or bring this, you know, just overwhelming sense of peace and just kind of right all the wrongs that the other person left in your life um and i'm sure you probably know that already but i think that's just an, another important thing to talk about um as when it comes to your own self-evaluation of being ready to be out and dating again and getting into another relationship and just being mentally mentally and spiritually prepared to you know talk about those things and to treat a, a person that's new in your life with those things surrounding it i think that's an important thing to note um but yeah i i definitely i'm not gonna say i understand a hundred percent what you feel but i think there's gonna have to be points where you just kind of push past the negative feelings you have potentially about yourself and i've talked about this before not in too much great detail but I was engaged when I was younger. And when that relationship ended, I definitely felt like I had a stain on my relationship career or my relationship history. And that made it challenging for me personally to ask other girls out or to try and move forward from that. Because in my mind, I was like, how could I tell another girl that I love her after being in this relationship that I was in that was so close to being a marriage relationship but fell through and didn't end up being a relationship. And yeah, I just had a lot of back and forth internally of like, I feel like a fraud. I feel, you know, like I'm not good enough. Like this person could do better. Like that people aren't going to want to have to deal with the baggage and the emotional you know, stuff that I would be bringing to the table, especially as a man with that experience. And I remember the first couple dates that I went on after, you know, finally being like, I'm going to go out there again and try and ask people out. And I tried to be upfront and present that information to people so that way they knew about it and weren't like blindsided because some people have really strong opinions about it. Like I said, there are going to be people that reject you for it. And on those dates that I went on, when I told those people those stories or even brought up some of the aspects of what I went through, I could see the visual <laughs> changes in their face of like, oh boy, this is a lot. I don't know if I'm ready for that. And I understood that like I, I as difficult as it was and as painful as it was to kind of feel like, yeah, I don't think anyone wants to deal with this. I think the Lord just kind of kept kept me sane and kept me focused on him and kept me growing in different areas of my life, helped me process that information, helped me deal with it properly. So that way I was no longer, um, you know, like I said, effectively bleeding on people that had nothing to do with the situation. And like I said, I know actually having been married and dealing with someone who's manipulative and emotionally abusing, I think that has way more weight than what I just explained. But it's the closest I can get to empathizing with where you're currently at and understanding that, yeah, there are going to be people that disqualify you and reject you for your past and for things that aren't even your fault. 
this person's actions towards you is not something that you directly caused. You can't make someone emotionally abusive, manipulative. You can't force that on you. Well, that's something that they chose to do. And the Lord will, you know, judge that person's actions towards you accordingly. But that doesn't change people perceiving information about you and making judgments and making opinions and treating you any type of way because of that information. So I think all in all, um, I think as long as you are a godly individual, as long as, you know, you're plugged in at a church and like I said in the first question, being proactive and looking for opportunities where you can engage with people and cultivate meaningful relationships, I don't think you'll have an overwhelmingly hard time finding a person that wants to be with you. That would be my general thought. But I just think it would be important for you to recognize the potential for this to be a roadblock for some people. And there may be some people that just need time to get past it. Um, like I said, just being transparent with that and allowing people an opportunity to do that is extremely important. But definitely don't cut yourself off from new relationships because of this past experience and like i said if the church's involvement was correct and proper and is helping you and guiding you i think that's important and will go a long way in your pursuit of a new relationship um so yeah i would say try to keep your head high as possible um focus on improving yourself in all aspects staying you know physically emotionally and mentally as fit as you can and being you know the best uh partner that you can be for someone to come along and say this person looks like someone that i would want to marry um so i think super complicated situation but trying to keep all those things in mind as you go forward will be helpful um and again i think if it's the lord's timing and if it's the lord's will for you to be remarried i think he will bring someone along who will be able to comfort you and to be able to guide you past that previous relationship and to be able to lead you in an effective way where you both can grow together through that uh traumatic experience and grow you closer to the lord because ultimately that's what marriage does so well is it just sanctifies you and it grows you and shows you how to be more christ-like in so many ways and again if that's his will for you i have no doubt that the lord will bring someone in that will be able to do that for you and to be able to lead you in a biblical and Christ-like way and love you regardless of, you know, that past experience and be able to love you well. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. And that is the last question for today. Thank you all for submitting questions. This was a lot of fun. I love interacting with you guys and talking about these issues. Um, if you guys have clarifications for any of my answers or want to ask another question, I'm happy to do another episode like this. Um, but yeah, feel free to either shoot me a DM on my Instagram or leave a comment on this video with a question that you'd like to see answered in a future video and I'll be sure to get to it. Hopefully I answered your questions in a way that's helpful, encouraged you in some way, or gave some new perspective or understanding to a situation that you're in. Don't forget to leave a like, a comment, and don't forget to subscribe for new uploads. And I will see you all on the next episode.